They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. It's Wednesday, October 26 at 1.36 p.m. and this is the TDN Writers Room. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. I'm Randy Moss with NBC Sports, being supervised back there on the couch by Lucy. I'm Zoe Cavan with First Racing. This is Doodle. He's about to exit. He's a bit camera shy. And I'm delighted to be here as always and always happy to see Lucy on the couch. Glad she's alive. <laughs> a lot of people think she's dead lying there, but she's bright and alive. I think this is the main reason people tune into the podcast, just to see what's happening with Lucy. Um, <laughs> I don't think we deserve any of the credit for how many uh, hits we get, but uh, uh, Lucy is definitely a star. By the way, the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Returning this November, Keeneland will offer a single session dedicated to racehorses on the final day of the November sale, which is November 17th. So let's take a look at what happened on the racetrack last weekend. Not a lot of big races. It's that time of year where people are getting their horses ready for the Breeders' Cup. A little close to the Breeders' Cup normally to have horses prepping. But out of Keeneland, we did have some Breeders' Cup news. The two stakes races were won by Steve Asmus and Gunnavite in the Perryville, Wicked Halo in the Raven Run. And Randy Moss, now we have the pre-entries out. Both those horses are entered back. Gunnite is first preference for the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. Wicked Halo is going in the Philly and Mayor Sprint. Wow, what's happening? Trainers running horses back in two weeks. And it has been done before. Shamrock Rose in 2018 won the Raven Run, wheeled back in two weeks by Mark Cassie in a 25 to 1, won the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mayor Sprint. Uh, two very good performances from the Asmussen horses last week, particularly Gunite, who's a really good horse. Uh, yeah, he's a legitimate grade one winner running in a non graded stakes race. Don't know how the Perryville's not graded. Maybe that'll be changed for next year. But uh, your thoughts on their races and them uh, being pre entered for the Breeders' Cup? Yeah, it's funny, Bill. Uh, one week ago when we were sitting here previewing the Perryville, I pointed out that, uh, that I was surprised that Gunite was going in the Perryville instead of the Breeders' Cup because I thought he would have an excellent chance in the Dirt Mile because we called Steve Asmussen and I talked to Steve a little bit about his Breeders' Cup horses. And I said, so Gunite's next race, are you looking at the Dirt Mile or the Sprint? And he said, we're actually going to run him in the Perryville. And I just assumed that that meant that they weren't going to run in the Breeders' Cup. But lo and behold, I mean, he he ran such a strong race in the Perryville to continue his really good form right now that I think he's in with a fighting chance in the dirt mile and what promises to be, though, a, a very, very tough race. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I thought I was absolutely sensational winning. And, you know, if Steve's wheeling back in two weeks, he knows there's more in the tank because Steve's definitely a guy who – who gets horses to peak just at the right time. So I guarantee he had that in the back of his mind and he won so easily that he was like, oh yeah, why not? Why not? And then the filly, the one, yes, she's in the filly and mare sprint, but you also have the runner up that's been pre-entered pre as well. She's on the outside looking in, that's Fingal's Cave, who may have run the best race of all in the Raven Run after getting squeezed at the start and making up all that ground on a track that was maybe just a tad Speed favoring. Zoe Fingles Cave, as you're right, ran a really good race. The New York bred trained by David Donk. Uh, she is 15th. She's the first also eligible, but there is right. one horse in the body of the race that it is the second preference for them. So it looks like uh, she will get in. So uh, I know you were uh, close to the people, the connections to that horse. So it does look like she'd have a fighting chance in there as well. Uh, Randy, uh, you, you said all along that Gunite would be in the Breeders' Cup dirt mile, or that's the, what you were thinking. Why not the sprint? Because he does have to go around two turns now. Yeah, I mean, he's going to be pre-entered, or he was pre-entered in both races with the preference given to the dirt mile. I think it really just boils down to the fact that Steve Asmussen already has Jackie's Warrior going in the sprint. And so I think he would rather separate, you know, these two horses, although, you know, he's not, there's not common ownership between the two horses. Uh, when Gunite, if he does indeed run in the dirt mile, I mean, this is what he's got up against him. Uh, you've got Cody's Wish, who just beat Jackie's Warrior on the up and up in their last race at Saratoga. Cyberknife, first preference is the Dirt Mile instead of the Classic. Uh, Laurel River, the horse trained by Bob Baffert, who's been running exceptionally be well. Yeah. Yeah, and just comes off a 108 buyer speed figure in a win out in California. Pipeline's been running well. He got sick. He missed a little training time. But obviously now, I mean, he's been pre-entered in both races again. Preference, the Dirt Mile. And Law Professor, who just ran a bang-up race, running second to life is good 
uh, in his most recent start. And that doesn't even count a horse like Senor Buscador and and maybe some others. So it's a tough spot for Gunite, but he's running really well right now. Yeah, obviously no easy spots in the Breeders' Cup. Now on Saturday, even though the action in the afternoon featured Keeneland, uh, the racing, I still think the biggest story of the day, Zoe, was Flightline. I mean, this horse, no matter what he does, I mean, him eating breakfast is a big story at this point in his career. And I know uh, you were out there to watch the workout on Flightline. Now he'll have one more workout uh, this Saturday. His last workout will be at Keeneland before the Breeders' Cup. But generally, most people think it's the second to last or the penultimate workout before a big race, which is the one that really matters. Uh, was, I know it was kind of dark when he was out there doing it, but Zoe, you are our eyes and ears at Santa Anita on Saturday. Uh, first of all, take, not only tell us what uh, what you thought of the work, but what was the atmosphere like? You know, How many people were out there? What kind of buzz was there to watch a horse just work out? There's not too much buzz at Santa Anita at 6.30 in the morning. There were a few more people than we've seen in times past. Uh, I mean, they came and they left and they came for breakfast at Clocker's Corner, but... You could barely just see him going down the backside. All you saw was the flashing light. Got a good view of him coming down the lane, and he basically clicked off perfect 12s all the way through. I got a chance to speak to Juan Laver afterwards, and he basically got him galloping out a mile and an eighth in 151 and change. So we're talking a serious work, a good gallop out. I was privy to go back to the barn after the work, and he was just – Cool, calm, and collected in the stall. Not a bother on him. He shipped out to Keeneland the very next day. There's actually uh, some video from West Point of him galloping on the track. Mike Mike Welsh actually timed his gallop this morning and got him coming through the lane in 28 and change. So he was basically two-minute licking this morning, which is on Wednesday, through the lane at Keeneland and took a really good hold of the bridle. The track had some moisture in it. He's never seen a wet track ever in his life. You know, it doesn't rain out here in Southern California, at least not when you don't want it to. Um, so he handled that very, very well. So, I mean, just just think if he's better on perhaps an off track or a track with some moisture. Isn't that a scary thought? I mean, his breeding suggests he should be better on an off track. That's scary. But, you know, I, I don't think maybe the average sports fan really understands the historic significance uh, of the Breeders' Cup Classic and flight line. Uh, I'm going to certainly try to impart that on the NBC telecast. But, I mean, look, when you, when you look at any kind of athletic performance, right? I mean, I have a long history as a mediocre golfer. But if I go out this afternoon and I shoot a 78, what's the chance that I'm going to come back out two days from now and shoot another 78? It's it's, you know, things were exactly perfectly right on, let's say, today on, on this given day for me to go out and do something like that. The odds are astronomical that that's going to be my norm from now on. When Secretariat ran in the Belmont Stakes and won by 31 links, he never duplicated that performance the rest of his career. He ran some sensational races, but not quite to the level of his Belmont Stakes. He lost twice to Onion and Prove Out following the Belmont Stakes. This was Flightline's first ever race, longer than a mile, first ever race around two turns. What if the Pacific Classic is the norm for Flightline going forward at a mile and a quarter? I mean, in my opinion, that puts him above any of the horses that we've seen since Secretariat. And that, and we're, you're talking Seattle Slew, Affirm, Spectacular Bid, Cigar, American Pharaoh, all these fantastic horses that we've seen. If this turns out to be the norm for flight line, my God, that just, that really puts him into um, another completely other echelon of horse mm -hmm. racing performance. Zoe, now I threw a big fat meatball right over the plate and you didn't knock it out of the park. You were about, you should have, what about XBTV for the <laughs> workout for Flightline? And also uh, you saw a lot of other good horses work out at Santa Anita over that last weekend, including Cave Rock. So take it away. Tell us how wonderful, and, and I'm not being the wise guy here. XBTV is fantastic. We all agree on that. But knock it out of the park, promote XBTV, and tell us what else you witnessed at Santa Anita over the weekend. Who looked good to you? Uh, well, there are just a plethora of workers this weekend. Cave Rock looked sensational. 
Laurel River. He's the XBTV Workout of the Week. We'll get to him a little bit later on. He looked terrific. Um, we've actually got works from Keeneland on our site as well. So we've teamed up with Keeneland and any works that they filmed at Keeneland, you'll be able to find on xbtv.com as well. I'm hoping they got um, a couple from this morning from Keeneland. Uh, I heard the Blue Stripe work very, very well this morning for Marcelo Polanco at Keeneland over a wet track, which is really interesting. But I have a feeling she went early. So I'm not sure the Keeneland cameras were up that early, but pretty much any work that's out there that's been videoed, you can find on XBTV. We have a Breeders' Cup portal and just go to that, tap in the horse's name and you will find it. In fact, Randy, this is, this is a task for you. You need to go oh. back in time, go, go to XBTV, put in flight line and go to a March the 7th work, 2021. Yeah. And take a look at that. It will take your breath away. It is unbelievable. Now, one wasn't aboard him. They were using someone else at that time. And basically, he was running off down the backside. He was 15 wide around the turn. He got behind some horses. He came out. He went. It was amazing. And he worked in 59 and change. And this was before he ever ran. That was before anyone knew who Flightline was. Go back and take a look at it. It is amazing. And that's one of the great things about XBTV. Have you I seen did it? Three, three days ago, Zoe, our good friend Amy Zimmerman at Santa Anita sent me an email. I told her. And said, yes. Said, you have to watch this workout. And it and it took me a while to hit, you know, page, 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 page to go back right. all through Flightline's workouts to get to March the 7th. But yeah, that uh, that is something really interesting with the, whoever the exercise rider was, his feet in the dashboard all the way yeah. down the lane. Uh, and he works in what, 59 and change or 58 and change? I don't remember what it was. 59 and was. two. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. take the credit for that one because I was, I looked back through all his works the other day. It took a long time because okay. I'm pretty sure we might, might have every work he's ever done, which is quite scary because he may have only run five times. But if you want to get a real feel for flight line, go to xbtv.com and you'll be able to find him running about 30 times once a week. All right. Now, normally here on the TDN Riders Room, we don't worry about maiden claiming races, but there was an interesting story this week at Parks on Monday. A horse by the name of Majestic Creed was dropped into a $25,000 maiden claimer. Horse was one to five, so it was supposed to win, Randy, but she won by 34 and three quarter lengths. Secretariat only won to Belmont by 31. Now, you know, again, we're not going to get silly and say that she's going to be a big star or anything like that. But uh, Randy, I take it you weren't all that impressed. Well, I mean, the horse wins by 34 lengths. So if 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 you're the owner, of the, and, and by the way, it was in a maiden $25,000 claiming race at Parks on Monday, and the horse was actually claimed out of that race for $25,000. Yeah. So, I mean, that's got to make you feel pretty good if you're an owner and you just drop a claim slip in for 25, then you watch your horse win by 34 and three quarters. But, you know, when you dig a little deeper into it, right, the buyer speed figure was 74. And this is a two-year-old, okay. so that's not bad, especially for a maiden claiming race, right? But you look at the, the 34 and three quarter length margin of victory, as you would expect, had a lot more to do in a five horse field with the quality of the competition that this horse faced than any sort of dynamic, unbelievable performance. The runner up, a horse named Aqua Bella, uh, had just come off a second place finish in a maiden 25 at Parks in which she earned a buyer speed figure of 14. And on Monday, she got a new career high buyer speed figure of 18. So the horses behind were not exactly runners. In other words, what I'm saying is owners feel proud, but if you just dropped a $25,000 claim slip in and you now have this horse in your barn and the phone rings and you get offered $125,000 for the horse, if it was my horse, sold. And Is Randy being too hard, Zoe? Hey, you, you can't help who you beat, right? You can't help who you beat. And owner Cheryl Richards put the money down to claim this one, uh, claimed by Bobby and Hawthorne. So big congratulations for them. I mean, that's exciting anytime you have a horse that wins by that much, let alone drop a claim on a horse who wins by that much, and then you're just praying everything is fine the next day. So hopefully we'll get to see this one run again, another progeny of Jimmy Creed. I mean, and that was the bug boy that rode that horse, Jose Gomez. Mm -hmm. That was in Saratoga. Yeah, kind of a neat story out of parks, definitely. 34 yeah. and three quarter lengths in the victory. 
Only a bug boy would let a horse win by 34 and three quarters <laughs> lengths. He wasn't asking this horse for anything. <laughs> but anyways. Okay. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. It is closing weekend this coming weekend at Keeneland. Bill, favorite race of the meet for you at Keeneland? I'm going to throw you a curveball here because I'm going to tell you something other than what I just told you. But now come to think of it, the Coolmore Turf Mile with Annapolis. That race was so loaded from top to bottom, just one big name talent after another. And Annapolis on that huge weekend Todd Pletcher had, where he also won with Forte in the Breeders' Futurity, uh, he really looked like a major threat. And he's going to be a major threat in the Breeders' Cup Mile, no doubt about it. Yeah, that would be my pick, Zoe. Just a reminder, we do have the Keeneland Horses of Racing Age sale on November the 17th, the standalone sale. If you happen to see the races at Santa Anita this past weekend, you will have seen Hopkins break his maiden for Hall of Famer Bob Baffert, a $900,000 yearling, yearling that was sold at Keeneland September. He will be offered as hip 5077 on November the 17th. Randy, are you going to buy any horses at the Horses of Racing Age sale? <laughs> Uh, let me check my bank account, Zoe. So, probably <laughs> not. Probably not. You know, what's interesting about this Hopkins thing and the Horses of Racing Age sale, Hopkins is one of 10 horses that is being sold by the group that we uh, sort of casually know as the Avengers, right? The ownership group, SF Racing, Starlight, Mataket, and then all the other partners they have who spend all this money on yearlings hoping to hit a home run with a potential stallion prospect, right? Well, these 10 horses that they've got in the sale are horses that have run pretty well. Classier won the Los Al Derby. Doppelganger was second in the San Felipe. We've seen Spielberg running some big races. They're all in this sale, Horses of Racing Age sale. The total amount that they sold for is yearlings, $6.5 million. And now they're being offered as racing prospects uh, in this Horses of Racing Age. A lot of horses owned by Seth Klarman, Peter Brandt. Uh, Three Diamonds Farm of, uh, of Kirk Wyckoff, uh, Windstar, Judd Mott. Uh, it's going to be a really interesting sales day. I think. That's November the 17th. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. When the thoroughbred world descends upon Lexington this November, there is one place you need to be. The place where history comes alive with every championship victory. He's off the dick indeed! The place where the future is built with the fall of a gavel. The place that exists to be the heart of this industry. The center of it all. Home to the November Breeding Stock Sale and the 2022 Breeders' Cup, Keeneland. Maximum security proves he's the real deal with a gate to wire win in the Florida Derby. Champion three-year-old. Maximum security has won the TBG.com Haskell Invitational. 11 triple digit buyers. Maximum security. He smoked them in the cigar mile. Grade one winning four-year-old. Maximum security takes them all the way in the TBG Pacific Classic. Secure your mayor's future. Maximum security. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Celestial City, a son of Uncle Mo, got his first career stakes win on Saturday in the Grade 2 Hill Prince. He's the 11th stakes winner of the year for Uncle Mo, who will once again top the Coolmore roster for 150000 And listen to this, guys. we got some newcomers coming to Coolmore, the roster including Corniche, who took down the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. He's going to stand for 30000 Early voting, the Preakness winner, going to stand for 25000 And Golden Powell just announced when he retires this year after the Breeders' Cup, he will go to Coolmore as well. Got some newcomers, some new faces. That's pretty good, huh? Yes, yeah, Zoe, absolutely. A very impressive roster. And some really interesting new sires coming to Coolmore to join that Hall of Fame roster that they already have. All right, the pre-entries to the Breeders' Cup are in. Not a lot of, you know, huge news stories to come out of it, but there were definitely some interesting developments in here. Randy Moss, I was, uh, you, you said maybe that you had heard about this earlier, but I hadn't. I was very surprised to see Latruska enter not, entered first of all in the Breeders' Cup period. And number two, entered not in the distaff, but in the Philly Mayor Sprint. Coming off just a, a really lackluster fourth place finish in the spinster. Um, what do you make of all that? Well, we were talking last week about how we expected her to be retired, and that was probably the right thing to do. But, you know, Fausto Gutierrez is obviously closer to Latruska than we are. And he went over with a fine tooth comb and found nothing amiss with Latruska and 
theorizes that she, in his words, she just doesn't want to run a mile and an eighth anymore. So they're going to give her one more shot to go seven furlongs instead of a mile and an eighth. There, there were no other real, I could say, surprises. Uh, maybe it was a little bit of a surprise, I guess, that what we already discussed, Steve Asmussen went in with Gun Knight and Wicked Halo off two-week gaps. Um, Jack Christopher, uh, the first preference is the sprint against Jackie's Warrior rather Jack than the dirt mile. It's, that was kind of already out there. Yeah, the battle of yeah, uh, the, the battle of Jack. Jack. Uh, the domestic spending thing is interesting. Also in the Chad Brown uh, barn, he he pre-entered uh, fourteen horses. By the way, that are expected to run uh, domestic spending coming into the uh, to the mile off of a four hundred and forty eight day layoff, which would just shatter the record uh, for a horse to win a Breeders' Cup race if he just happened to do it. Uh, Charlie Appleby's got a couple of favorites. He's bringing seven over, Aiden O'Brien, 11. Pletcher, we talked to him last week, uh, 10 Breeders' Cup starters. He's kind of loaded as well. So as you would expect, uh, we'll have a lot to talk about on Breeders' Cup Day. Yeah, Zoe, it's, what it's, caught your eye from the pre-entries? Uh, I mean, the Jack Christopher and the sprint rather than the mile running up against Jackie's Warrior. Um that for one, I mean, really no massive surprises. Channel Maker, it'll be good to see him. He's overmatched, but hey, you never know. That's why we run the race, right? What if we get all the rain they've been talking about forever? Maybe he could like trudge through on the lead or something. But no real massive surprises for me going forwards. I mean, the, the biggest surprises, a knock on wood, will probably be some defections coming up because that's what always happens. Channel Maker will be the first horse ever to compete in six Breeders' Cup races. He, I think we wow. mentioned this a few weeks ago. He started yeah. off in the juvenile turf, and then he's been in the Breeders' Cup. He hasn't won yet, but he was tied with four other horses making five Breeders' Cup appearances, and this would be a record. This would be a sixth. We've got three defending champs coming back, Aloha West in the sprint, CC in the Philly and Mare sprint, and Golden Pal in the turf sprint, so all three are sprinters. And we have four other horses that have previously won another Breeders' Cup race. Echo Zulu, Life is Good, uh, Modern Games, and Order of Australia. So a lot of familiar names, Bill. How about yeah. Aloma West and his work? He worked this morning, I believe, at Keeneland in like 58 and change. Like rocket wicket fast. And so, you know... Catman's like, well, I'm going to put both of mine in there. Maniwa's going in there. Aloha West going in there. He's never been better by all accounts. So a couple of news and note, other news and notes. As you mentioned, Randy, let's run down Channel Maker. Eight years old. This will be his 47th career start. In 2021, he ran this race, finished fifth. In 2020, finished third. 2019, finished 12th. 2018, finished 11th. Did not run in the Breeders' Cup in 2017. And in 2016, as you mentioned, he ran the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf and finished seventh. But uh, back to it, um, I guess I'm not surprised that Jack Christopher chose the, or Chad Brown chose for Jack Christopher the sprint. But when I was talking to him earlier, asking him where he was going to go, he said, I'm going to figure out which race I have the best chance of winning. And so he obviously came to the conclusion that it was the Breeders' Cup sprint. Now, I'm not you know, who am I to second guess Chad Brown? But the thing I would put about, is this the best chance he has of winning because of, and, and I think maybe you can make a case he has a better chance of winning the dirt mile just because of Jackie's warrior. I know he's not coming into the race off one of his better performances, but I thought he would have been the favorite in the dirt mile and he will be the second choice in the Breeders' Cup sprint. Well, okay. If I can put myself in Chad Brown's shoes, I can guess as to uh, as to what he might be thinking. The dirt mile, yeah, he would be the favorite. But we ticked off all of the horses that he would be competing against who have a really legitimate chance to run exceptionally well in the dirt mile. When you go to the sprint, you've got the horse of Judd Mons, Elite Power, who looked really good winning the Vosburg, but he hasn't really taken his game to this kind of level yet. And then Jackie's Warrior. And then other than that, you don't really see anything that you think would – would threaten Jack Christopher. And then there's this, as good as Jackie's warrior is, and we've seen him run some absolutely sensational races, on the two biggest days of his life at the Breeders' Cup, he came up empty. The first time he was in the juvenile going a mile and a 16th, which obviously now we know is beyond his distance capabilities. 
but he was the second heaviest favorite of all the Breeders' Cup races that year. And then last year, he was again the second heaviest favorite in the 14-race Breeders' Cup card to only uh, uh, Gamine. It was hard to envision him losing the Breeders' Cup sprint, and yet he did. So that may be at least in the back of the mind, in in the back of Chad Brown's mind. He's he's probably got Jackie's Warrior to beat, and he's come up disappointing a couple times with some severe pace, well, severe pace pressure last year in the sprint. Uh, that maybe he could be vulnerable again for similar reasons. I don't know. Yeah, never be afraid of one horse, and the fact that. Obviously, there have been chinks in his armor. He has been beaten. Breeders' Cup, Breeders Cup is basically his kryptonite. Um, yeah, why not? So a field of eight uh, entered the Breeders' Cup Classic. Actually, nine because Cyberknife is cross not his first preference for the dirt mile. Just no surprises here whatsoever. Epicenter, Flightline, Happy Saver, Hot Rod, Charlie, Life is Good, Olympiad, Rich Strike, and Tabus. So likely a field of eight in the Breeders' Cup Classic. And my friend Tyler's Tribe is going to be in the Breeders' Cup two-year-old sprint. Uh, say he did also enter the uh, juvenile as well, pre-entered, but his first preference is for the um, Breeders' Cup turf, uh, juvenile turf sprint. That's a mouthful, the Breeders' Cup juvenile turf sprint. Uh, did anyone watch his workout on the turf the other day and, and get any opinions of it? Um, I heard some Twitter uh, people say it wasn't. he didn't look that good. Just slow. He's out there on his own, just galloping around there. I don't think he wanted too much. I saw the first one. Did he work again? I don't know. I mean, probably I'm just talking about that. I first saw word. one. He didn't look like he loved it, but he didn't look like he hated it. I mean, you're asking a two year old to go around the dogs that are on the outside fence at Keeneland, first time out there with no horses to follow. It's a lot to ask. He was looking around and better too slow than too fast. I, I thought he was fine. Do I think the turf is going to move him up? No. Is it really going to hurt him? Probably not. Hopefully we don't get the rain they were ex expecting because I'm not sure he'll like a, a good bit of give in the ground per se. But if it's a good firm turf course, I don't think he'll mind it. So you a keep lot. trying to predict that you keep trying to predict that rain a week out, a week and a half out. That would be like you know me trying to sweep the triple crown with my picks in uh, February or something like that. So just the weathermen don't. I'm keeping my fingers crossed, but they don't have to be right about this. I mean, even assuming Tyler's tribe gets firm turf, I, there was a lot made, Bill, in that workout about the fact that he hopped over to his left lead at the 16th pole coming down the stretch. We know some horses if they. If they're unsure about the footing or they don't like the footing or whatever, they'll change leads back and forth. But that's the first time he'd ever worked on the turf. So I I, I think we'd be putting a little pass. too much emphasis on that. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Well, we will see how Tyler's Tribe does. So uh, segueing away from the Breeders' Cup, there's a story that came out this week. A veterinary journal uh, published a study. And the headline, if you just go on the headline, and I wrote the story for the Thoroughbred Daily News myself, is that horses 60 are 62% more likely to die if they raced on Lasix, then without Lasix. Now, first of all, this doesn't, it wasn't about horses that break down in a race. It's talking about, and I didn't even realize this was a statistic that anyone kept, but they called it a sudden death, meaning that a horse got through a race and then from something other than a catastrophic uh, injury uh, suffered on the racetrack would pass away within three days of a race. Now, in and of itself, you look at that and say, oh my goodness, here's another reason to just absolutely get rid of Lasix. And I do think the sport should do away with Lasix, and it's going to happen with Hissa in there. Got this three-year window to, to uh, phase everybody out of it. But if you dig a little bit deeper, um, here's what we – I think this is th something that wasn't said about this, is that who doesn't run on Lasix in this country right now? Well, two-year-olds and stakes horses. Everybody else virtually, you know, 95 96% of all horses are on Lasix. What is this? The two-year-olds and stakes horses are supposed to be the safest kind of racing because stakes horses aren't going to get to that level if they're unsound. And statistics have shown that horses are less likely to break down or die uh, racing as two-year-olds than they are as five or six-year-olds. So look, it, it, it didn't make Lasix look good. It would be one more reason to phase it out, which I said I'm all in favor of. But I think you do have to read a little bit beyond the headline, Randy. Yeah, I mean, it basically, it's, it was funded by the uh, by the Grayson Jockey Club from 2009 to 2021. So if you're talking 2009, 2000, everybody used Lasix. Basically, 94% of the horses that they studied were on 
on Lasix. This is like saying, if you eat a cheeseburger once in your life, you're going to die of a heart attack. That guy died of a heart attack because he had a cheeseburger. That's what it equates to. We need more information on this study going forward. 518 of the 536 were on Lasix. 94% of those horses that died were on Lasix. So we just basically need more studies. I'm a proponent of Lasix. I'm not a proponent of what the outside world thinks of Lasix. And I, I'm with you. It's probably going to be banished because everyone thinks people use it to mask and they cheat and all these other things. It's public perception at the end of the day is what is going to get rid of Lasix. Is it better for the horses? Yes. But right now in this day and age, it's all about public perception. So Lasix will be wiped out. So I think we just need a little bit more information in this study, because if you just go off the headline and that's what they want you to go off, it's glaring. It's shocking. You're like, oh, my God, these horses are dying because they're getting Lasix. And they're all getting Lasix. We don't really know why they're dying. We just need more information and more done on this study. Well, and to put it in perspective, uh, the rate of sudden death that they uh, that they mentioned in the study was only one for every approximately 7,600 starters in America. So that would be an average of about, you know, one for every 100 racing days at a racetrack. I mean, that's one too many. You never want to see a horse, you know, experience sudden death. But there were a lot of other really interesting things that that came out of this study beyond Lasix that made sense. You know, when you when you look at all of their findings, you look at it and you think, well, okay, that makes sense. For example, some of them are even too obvious. Horses are more likely to experience sudden death in the summer than in the winter. Well, one of the causes for sudden death is heat stroke. So obviously it's going to happen less often in the winter. Older horses were more susceptible than younger horses. Of course, that makes sense. Uh, recency. Horses that had more recent racing were less likely to experience sudden death. There's a fitness component there. Horses that are less fit are obviously more likely to experience a cardiac event than horses that have been racing that are at their peak level of fitness. But I thought this was most interesting of all. This indicates, Bill, you were talking about stakes horses. This indicates, and it kind of makes sense, that the faster a horse runs, the more likely it is to experience sudden death. And in, in, in other words, you know, the, the more strain, the, the faster a horse runs, you can theorize, the more strain he's putting on his, on his system and therefore the more likely that he is to experience a sudden death episode. Horses that run for higher purses are more at risk. Horses that have more lifetime wins are more at risk. Horses that run in state bred company have a 41% less chance. They're probably 41% slower than horses that run against open companies. So there are a lot of other little interesting things that came out of this. Lasix is the one that's obviously going to get the headline. And I agree with you guys that it's interesting, but it does need more stuff. The TD and Riders Room is brought to you by the Kentucky Thoroughbred Association. This just in, Kentucky breads are your best chance at grade one success. That's something that we've known for a long, long time. Recent grade one victress, Gina Romantica, who won the Queen Elizabeth II Challenge Cup at Keeneland, was bred in Kentucky by Craig and Carrie Brogdon of McMur Hall. Wicked Halo, also, we've talked about her, the daughter of Gunrunner, who took this weekend's Raven Run, was bred in Kentucky, and she is a homebred for Winchell Thoroughbreds. We'll be right back after this message from the KTA and the KTOB. With some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year round, there's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all time high, as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Breads. Breed them, raise them, race them. We all win. Unified, a three-time graded stakes winner by leading sire Candy Ride, defeating multiple grade one winner Mind Your Biscuits in the Gulfstream Park Sprint, and second in the grade one Carter by a nose. With multiple stakes winners in his first crop, including Roger McQueen, 
and unified report. Unified, a proven winner on the track, a proven stallion in the making. The Lanes Inn Stallion of the Week is Mineshaft, the 2003 Horse of the Year, a top 20 lifetime active sire. Mineshaft will be represented in the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile by ACAC Stakes winner, Senor Buscador. You can breed to Mineshaft. He stands for $10,000 at Lanes Inn. It's something I didn't know about Mineshaft, but I'll bet you Zoe knew. Mineshaft began his career in England with John Gosden. I guess I knew that once upon a time, Zoe, but I'd forgotten all about that one. Yeah, that was a long, long time ago. In fact, I was down in New Orleans galloping horses for Christopher Speckett when Mineshaft was down there with Neil Howard. He was a really, really outstanding horse, a beautiful horse on the racetrack. Really cool dude. And he's proven to be a successful stallion as well. Now, the Green Group Guest of the Week, sponsored by the Green Group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, the Green Group has proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help at www.greenco.com. And welcome in now our Green Group guest of the week, Bill Farish from Lane's Den Farm, also a co-owner of the amazing Flight Line. Bill, welcome, and let's get right into it. Major news this week, Lane's Den Keeneland is teaming up and the partners that are involved in Flight Line to sell a share in him at the Keeneland November sale. Matter of fact, it'd be the very first thing that goes into the ring when Keeneland November uh, clicks off and begins. Um, just tell it, take us through the reasoning why this is happening and how exciting it is. Well, it's very exciting, uh, Bill, because it it, um, uh, it the idea sort of came into being. Uh, our ad agency, Cornet Group, came to us with the idea of doing some kind of sale in the metaverse, um, and utilizing the metaverse, which of course was something I was not familiar with. But um, but anyway, I, I was interested to hear what they had to say, and uh, you know, immediately you think, well. To pull something like that off, you need something significant uh, to, to pull people's attention and, and to make it successful. Um, and and we, the idea did pop into my head at that point that, you know, a share in flight line would, uh, might be something that, that fit that bill. Uh, we went, we approached Keeneland about it. It just so happened that Keeneland was uh, working on a metaverse type, you know, looking for something to to uh, to uh, to use and uh, use the metaverse for, so uh, it it was a perfect fit, and uh, you know, luckily uh, we, this was pre Pacific Classic, so uh, we we kind of didn't want to go too far with the plan until after that, and of course that just uh, got us more excited than than ever about about using it. So, Bill, you're selling two and a half percent, correct? So. We've got the who, what, when, where down, but what are the reasons why you guys have decided to do this? Well, this is a share of West Point thoroughbreds, and as you know, they're a, a primarily, not totally, but primarily a racing uh, syndicate, and uh, you know they have a significant piece of this horse, and uh, you know it's, I think it's a way for them to to. Uh, take you know the proceeds that are generated and, and pay back their investors uh, some part of uh, of their investment in the syndicate bill how does this correlate with the fact that it's gonna, he's going to be sold that 2.5 percent is going to be sold after the breeders cup classic so whoever's going to be buying into him doesn't really know if the horse is going to run again does this go into perhaps a piece of a stallion share? How is that going to be figured out? If someone owns 2.5%, how does that move forward into stallion shares? Well, it, it's a good question, but it's, it's uh, you know, 2.5% is 1 40th of, of the horse, which is equates to one share in a 40 share syndicate. And uh, so it, it is, in fact, um, uh, equal to a share. Um, and and will be you know upon his retirement will become a share in the stallion. But if he races on, they will get two point five percent of any proceeds from his racing. 
Now, Bill, to those, those of us who are a little, little gray in the uh, little gray beards and not you know up on the latest technology, and you said you yourself weren't all that familiar with the metaverse. Tell us as best you can how this is going to work, what the experience will be like. Yeah, so I've seen some demonstrations, obviously, and Keeneland's uh, gone a long way in sort of recreating the look and feel of the sales pavilion. It really, the metaverse part of it is is more experiential. It's not, it's you, you can't actually bid in the metaverse. So you can observe the whole thing happening, but you can, to bid, you either have to be on site, on the phone, or, or have somebody there bidding for you. You know, one of the attractions of doing this was this horse didn't go through the triple crown. So he, you know, we, we all know within the industry who he is and appreciate who he is, but he hasn't reached that greater audience of, of uh, casual fans in the in the horse business and in the horse industry and the horse the sport. And so so this gives us an opportunity, I think, to to bridge that gap a little bit and to put our sport out there to the tech world to some degree and and also to to a whole different fan base that uh, might not normally follow a horse like like Flightline. So, Bill, at, at risk of putting the cart before the horse, because we've still got the Breeders' Cup Classic to go, obviously, but you uh, you said the phrase, if he races on. Mm-hmm. I know you've been asked this probably 5,000 times already, but let's make it 5,001. But what will be the factors that you and your partners will be looking at to try to determine whether to retire him after the Breeders' Cup or to say, economics be damned, we're going to go ahead and race him more. Well, you know, obviously it's a it's a great question and it's asked differently every time, but but that was well well phrased. <laughs> um, yeah, there there are a lot of factors that go into it, and they're in you know having five different partners, you have uh, you know a varying uh, array of of different interests, but uh, I think it you know it. it it's it's so hard to say how we're going to feel after this race. You know, if he, you know, trying to speculate if he if he were to put on a tremendous performance as he did out in California, would there be worlds left to conquer or not? Um, is is sort of one way to look at it. Another way would be there are all these worlds out there to conquer, and and it'd be a lot of fun to go to go do that. And, and, you know, we're all fans of the sport, first and foremost, or we wouldn't be in it. And uh, so it's, you know, the experience of having something to do with a horse like this is, is just overwhelming and, and incredibly exciting, obviously. And, um, you know, it, it's sort of uh, in some ways it speeds up your life. In some ways it slows down your life because it uh, feels like an eternity between races. Uh, and it is, <laughs> but, um, but it, uh, but it, at the same time, it, it's hard to believe, uh, how fast it all happens. And, um, so it, it's a, it's a tough question for me to answer. Cause I don't know how we're all going to feel after this race. And that's going to have a, a huge amount of influence. We're, you know, we're going to look at, you know, a myriad of different things. You know, it's, a, he's, he's a very, very valuable horse. And it's not just a financial concern. It's a it's a um, health and safety of the horse concern as well. So so there's a lot of things that will go into that decision. And uh, we're, you know, a very friendly group of owners and everybody. uh, Everybody has gotten along really well so far, and uh, which isn't always the case when you have a good horse with multiple owners. uh, But but so far, so good. So let me jump in and I want to ask a follow up question on that. And we'll get back to you. Bill, with the, the Keeneland November sale uh, coming, what, uh, two days after the Breeders' Cup, uh, I don't know you guys don't want to rush things, but the potential buyer probably does want to know if he's buying a horse that's going immediately to stud. He or she is buying a horse going immediately to stud, horse that's going to race next year. Will the decision need to be made before the sale of the share? I think it would be good if, if it, um, you know, if it can be made. On Sunday, uh, that would be helpful, and it's certainly our intention to to talk on Sunday. Uh, we've all we've all discussed that, so um, that th- that will be the plan. You know, you hate to ever 
make any big decision like this without having plenty of time to think about it. But, uh, you know, I think we've all given it a lot, you know, a lot of different scenarios, a lot of thought. And um, and so we we hopefully will be able to make a decision before the sale. But for the, you know, if, if you own the horse yourself and he was your baby, hand on heart, what would you do? You know, I try to look at it that way, <laughs> um, <laughs> but and and it's uh, you know, I don't know. It, it's a great question because if it, it if it's all your horse, it's it it magnifies the decision even more uh, and the repercussions even more. You know, it's a uh, so I think we will do what I would do if he were all mine, but. Uh, but I can't really tell you what that what that's going to be. Did you ever imagine you would own a piece of a horse like Flightline? I mean, you've had a lot of good horses in your years at Lane's End. Did you ever imagine you would have a horse of such magnitude as Flightline that's basically set the world alight? Yeah, I, I, you know, no, no. You, you always hope you, you know, are in, in a position like this, um, but. No, I, I don't think I could have imagined a horse like Flightline. I, um, you know, we've all we've all been been very lucky to witness a lot of great horses. And uh, but gosh, I you know this this guy really um, he just keeps redefining those those parameters for me personally. I I, I don't know. You know, I, I I love to hear everybody else comparing him to some of these great horses that. Um, that we've all all got to see run, but um, yeah, he's he's just incredible. I, it's a it's a it's a dream come true for sure. Now, Bill, with the Breeders' Cup coming up again, asking to put the listeners and the viewers into your shoes, do you get extra nervous with this horse because of all the ramifications, because of his huge uh, reputation, or you know, if you're going to be two to five, three to five, is that sort of easier than maybe being running running the ten to one shot in the Breeders' Cup Classic? Mm -hmm. Well, I hate to ever be two to five, three to five, because I've never seen the win. But, <laughs> but I, I think it's it's odd with this horse because I always fear every other horse in the race, and uh, you know I always think that uh, that there's going to be a, uh, you know nerves are play a much bigger role normally than they do with this horse and. Uh, I was quite nervous before the Pacific Classic only because. I'm seeing too many horses not be able to stretch out and, you know, until they're asked that question and, and, you know, you sit there and, and mull over in your mind, how many different ways it won't work. Um, so with him you know, stretching out for the first time, even though he, you know, he has the physical appearance of a horse that, that could do that. He's certainly bred to do it. Uh, but waiting until that part, you know, till that part of your four-year-old year, August, your four-year-old year, uh, that's a long time. And, you know, horses that run routes don't usually have to wait that long to go to go two turns. Uh, so so that was another thing that entered into to, to my concern. But um, I was so emotional after the race because of the way he did it. So, Bill, you literally were born into the sport. You've been involved in it your whole life. Uh, and even though your father may not be involved with Wood, 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 Woodfield Woodward Racing, All right. uh, what's his, how has he enjoyed this whole flight line process? No, I think he's really enjoyed it. You know, he, he was out there with me yesterday looking at him uh, at feed time. And, you know, it's just we all appreciate special horses and love seeing them and trying to figure out you know what makes them what they are but um but i think it's been a, a special treat for him bill if i had told you 20 years ago that you would be selling a portion of a horse 2.5 percent on a thing called the metaverse using an avatar would you look to me and said i was crazy I'd still say you're crazy, <laughs> but I still don't know what it is. But no, I kind of, I, I kind of do. But, uh, but I, 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 yes, I would have said you were crazy. But we didn't. Um, I'm not sure we we might just have had cell phones twenty years ago, so it would it would be hard to imagine. 
<laughs> is this something that Lane's End is going to try and continue? Because I know you mentioned that Keenan had already thought about this. Is this basically a window to the future? You know, it could be. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, I you know, I think it's a first step in in doing that. I I just you know, I'm a real believer that that horse sales have to be horse sales. Like you know, it's too much too much touch and feel and, and see in live in person. So while you can bid from afar, it's, it's, you, you really have to conduct the sale. You know, there, there's, there's a reason why they, they work so well when they do that, you know, it's, you know, it's the urgency of this is a, the time to buy, you know, and, and having these online sales all through the year is, is helpful for in some cases, but it would never take the place of a, you know, 4,000 horse sale, I don't think. I want to thank Bill Farish from Lane's Ends Farm so much for his time and all the insights into a very exciting development. Not only is Flight and Line a share in him going to be sold at Keeneland November, but they're going to do it through the metaverse. Good stuff, interesting stuff, and good luck to Flight Line and the Breeders' Cup Classic, Bill. Great. Thank you, Bill. The Green Group Guest of the Week was sponsored by the Green Group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Guest of the Week, Bill Farish will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from the Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. The workout of the week from XBTV is Breeders' Cup mile contender Laurel River, the recent winner of the Grade 2 Pat O'Brien, seen working here in 59 and 2. And really, if you watch this horse at the top of the lane, he broke off with a horse behind him, a Mark Glatt trainee. And then he comes to the top of the lane, and there are a couple of Vladimir Sarin trainees. This horse ate some dirt. You can see Juan Ochoa got his feet on the dashboard. This was a sensational work. Coming down the lane, stops the clock, 59 and 2. He's never the best workhorse galloping out past the wire. The Laurel River, most certainly the workout of the week. You can catch that on xptv.com. Now the weekend preview brought to you by Three Chimneys. We'll take a look at some of the stakes action going around this weekend. And then after that, we'll come back and take a look at the field now of the pre-entered horses for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Uh, kind of a quiet weekend, as you would expect. But Zoe, I want to start with you because it's not a quiet weekend at Santa Anita. There's something going on in terms of what's going to happen on the racetrack and also something going on. Maybe someone could walk away with a million bucks. Tell us more. Yeah. Absolutely, Bill. While the rest of the country is sleeping and perhaps looking forward to Breeders' Cup, we're going to have our own mini Breeders' Cup this weekend at Santa Anita. They'll be drawing the races today for Saturday, and we're expecting seven stakes worth in excess of $1 million, highlighted by a couple of grade two events. Uh, we are talking about the Gold Cova coming in here and a couple of others that Twilight Derby's worth 200,000, seven stakes, and that's all going to evolve around the pick six. Now, a lot of times we have a single ticket winner. Now, this weekend, if there is a single ticket winner, listen to this, Randy. Um, mm -hmm. First racing is going to give up a million dollars. If you are the only ticket winner in the pick six, you will get a bonus of a million dollars. 
The carryover going into Saturday's pick six is 143,000. So a million reasons to play the pick six at Santa Anita and seven terrific stakes on the card. And looks like we'll see going global in the Goldacova stakes. She's going to face Avenue de France. She was originally slated to perhaps go to the Breeders' Cup. But Phil D'Amato keeping her home, and she will most certainly be a single, I do believe, on a lot of people's tickets. She'll be in the grade two Goldacova. So at Keeneland, we've got the Fayette and the Bryan Station on Saturday. Fayette is kind of, uh, you know, the conditions might be for really good horses that aren't quite good enough to run in the Breeders' Cup Classic. But you do have first captain in there. He was third in the Jockey Club Gold Cup, won the Pimico Special earlier in the year. And for those of us who like Tyler's Tribe, go Iowa Breds. How about Ain't Life Grand, the winner of the Iowa Derby? Last time out, seventh in the Traverse. He'll be in there as well as King Fury. Brian Station, Classic Causeway, won the Belmont Derby in June of grade one. We'll face off against, among others, Wit, who won the Better Talk Now stakes last time out for Todd Pletcher. And Val Cove is shipping in from your neck of the woods, Zoe, from California. Uh, Aqueduct will have the Kelso and the Bold Ruler on Saturday. Uh, Kelso has an interesting horse. Now, I hate to say this because we're talking about it before the entries come out. So Steve Asmussen, please run this horse. But how about Morello? Remember him? He won the Gotham and looked like he was going to be a major player along the way. Then he ran a, a clunker in the Wood Memorial, came back and run another clunker in the Woody Stevens. But Steve Asmussen brought him back a couple weeks ago. He won an allowance race at, uh, at Laurel, of all places, to prep for this race. And uh, the Kelso, no longer a prep for the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. Used to be. Remember, Life is, is Good won the – didn't Life is Good win the Kelso? Or, yeah, um, which was it was situated as a prep for the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. Obviously, one week before the Breeders' Cup, nobody's going to come out of that and run in there. But it should be a really interesting weekend of racing at Keeneland, Belmont, and Aqueduct, and especially at Santa Anita with those seven stakes races. Uh, you know, a smart move by Santa Anita to, to you know, in a, in a day, Zoe, when not much is going on around the country, they're going to steal the show, I think. Yeah, I mean, they really are. And I think the bonus of a million dollars on top of the pick six, mm -hmm. if you're the only winner, is certainly a big key because a lot of times we just had it a couple of weeks ago where it's the jackpot and it's like a regular pick six, but this is a single ticket winner with a chance of winning a million dollars. And it's going to be a really, really good card. A lot of turf racing. You'll find more and more over here on the left coast that we're utilizing our turf course an awful lot. Probably 60% of the races are now on turf because we have so many turf courses to choose from. So good races. Full fields, and that is what we're hoping for. And of course, it's going to be sunny. It doesn't rain that out here. Bonus, that million dollars yeah. certainly captured my attention, Zoe. That's yeah, yes. absolutely right. The TD and Riders Room and the weekend preview is brought to you by Three Chimneys. Of course, Three Chimneys, the home of Gun Runner. We talked about Wicked Halo and Gunite winning for Steve Asperson at Keeneland. Both. Uh, the son and a daughter of Gun Runner, and of course, Gun Runner off to an amazing start in his first crop. You're looking at early voting, the Preakness winner, Echo Zulu, the champion two-year-old filly, Cyberknife, winner of the Arkansas Derby and the Haskell, Taba, winner of the Santa Anita Derby and the Pennsylvania Derby. Three of those will be competing in the Breeders' Cup next weekend as well. We'll be right back for part two of the weekend preview after this message from Three Chimneys. Here comes Tabor. Tabor in the center of the track with good looking stride. Squares off with Cyberknife. Cyberknife takes the lead. Tabor going with him. These two in a thriller. Cyberknife just in front. And Cyberknife has won the TBG.com Haskell over Tabor. Jack Christopher finished third. The running time, 1 minute 46.24 seconds. Come, dream with us at Three Chimneys. And welcome back to the weekend preview. We're going to do something a little bit different here. And we've been, I've been making Randy Moss do double duty. Now he's on the podcast, but he's our official morning line maker for the Breeders' Cup. We've, we've gotten his line for the Classic. We got his line for the Distaff. This week, I want to get his line for what I think is an, another one of the really outstanding races on the Breeders' Cup card. Randy, you made a line for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. No surprise here, Cave Rocket, Even Money. Is he the biggest favorite on the card next to, uh, next to Flightline? He's got to be, right? I would I would think so. With Jack Christopher running against Jackie's Warrior, uh, he's going to take a lot of play in there. Um, you know, Modern Games has got some competition in the mile. So, yeah, I, I think that's probably a pretty accurate statement. I could have gone as low as four to five on Cave Rock, and I thought about it. Uh, but ultimately, the points balanced out better at even money because I think 
National Treasure, Forte, Blazing Sevens are all going to get some play. I wouldn't be surprised, even though I've got Forte as a slight second choice, I wouldn't be surprised to see National Treasure be the second choice. The speed figure guys, I think, are going to have him with a slightly higher number than Forte, but Forte has that grade one win in the Breeders' Futurity, whereas National Treasure is still looking for his first stakes win. But those four should be significantly higher than verifying uh, the well-bred horse by a son of Justify trained by Brad Cox. And then you have the rest of them that are going to be a pretty big price after that. But Cave Rock, Zoe, is a very exciting horse to look forward to. Uh, I know you've been uh, pleased and you've been impressed by the way he's been training out there for Bob Baffert. And he's certainly done nothing wrong in his races so far. He's a very relaxed horse. I actually swung by Bob's barn yesterday and, you know, Bob was in a jovial mood and I'm like, come on, let me, let me go see Cave Rock. And he's like, oh. And then, of course, he took me, you know, usually your best horse is in the front stall by your office, right? No, we're in the back 40. We went all the way around to the other end of the barn. Down at the end, he's got a nice window and he was flat out in his stall, just flat out, not a bother on him. Two doors down, they were actually clipping uh, Bob's other horse in the juvenile. So he was outside, the clippers were going and they were clipping him. But yeah, Cave Rock had his head out the door and just flat out. So we got a good look at him, got a good look at National Treasure, who's a big, tall, growthy looking horse. Uh, reading between the lines, if it wasn't for the ownership group that he has, I don't, I'm not sure he would be going to the Breeders' Cup. He looks like a horse who's in a growing spurt. I have no doubt he's a very, very good horse, but he just looks like he's growing right now. And next year is probably going to be where he makes a lot of the hay next year. I think he's going to be a much better horse next year. We're just seeing the raw bones. But Cave Rock is just a, a bulky tank. Yes, he moves like Arrogate on the racetrack. He's got that low head carriage and he just skips along the ground, but he's got a lot more substance. He looks much more like a three-year-old than Arrogate ever did in his two-year-old year. So I got a good look at him. And then Bob like pulled me around the other side of the barn. He's like, come on, come on, come and have a look at Tabor. You know, I went and had a good look at Gunrunner. And he's like, it's amazing how much he looks just like Gunrunner. We went in the stall and he's like, I, I love him like right here the barrel bit, and he's getting a little bit higher in his withers. And he is a compact horse, Tabor, but he again has hit a bit of a growth spurt and he really does look terrific going in there. And I mean, make no bones about it. If everything goes well for flight line, the rest of them are running for second, but you know, they still all got to cross the wire first. So we'll have to see, but Bob was very excited. It was, it was kind of cool just to walk around murderer's row in the Baffert shed row. Mm. Now, a horse that wasn't entered, and we knew this was going to be the case, no Loggins, who was so impressive when running second in the Breeders' Futurity at Keeneland. I, I would have given him the best chance to beat um, Cave Rock, even though he got beat by Forte in that race at Keeneland. He had a difficult trip. He fought gallantly. The wire came back on that horse. But Brad Cox said, you know, look, I, I really want to win the Kentucky Derby here with this horse. It would be for him to come back in the Breeders' Cup would have been three races in seven weeks. He admitted that the horse came out of the Breeders' Futurity at Keeneland kind of tired, didn't bounce back out of the race like he, he wanted to. Said if he was tearing the barn door down, I would have entered him. But Randy, um, where does Loggins fit into this? And are we going to see a uh, East Coast, West Coast rivalry of Cave Rock and Loggins on the way to the Kentucky Derby? I mean, a million things can go wrong to derail that. But right now, I think they're the, the top two two-year-olds out there. I mean, it could it also be an East Coast, West Coast rivalry between Cave Rock and Forte. Let's see how Forte runs right. in the Breeders' Cup. I mean, he's done nothing wrong so far. But I think, and they ran against each other, obviously, in the Breeders' Futurity. And you and I both, and Zoe probably as well, came out of that race thinking that Loggins long-term would probably be the better horse, given his inexperience going into that race, given the trip that he had, a very, very fast pace, and he was on the engine all the way. And yet he was still fighting back gallantly through the lane while all the other horses that were close to the pace finished way, way back in the pack. Uh, I'm excited about Loggins' chances uh, as a three-year-old. I know Brad Cox is as well. I talked to him also. Um, and I think it's the right decision not to run him in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile uh, for all the reasons that you cited. But looking ahead, I think he is a horse we can get excited about. I think it's actually refreshing to see a trainer trying to do the right thing by the horse. Now, we don't exactly know how he came out of the race, but I mean, that's Brad's story and he's sticking to it and he's going to put him away for next year. So kudos to them just to miss the dance and go for the big dance next year. 
The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of an instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class racehorses. Just think, this past weekend, Decorated Invader got back in the winner's circle at Woodbine. They also had a redline overdrive, a son of Nyquist, trained by Todd Fletcher to break his maiden at Goldstream Park. Coming up, they have a big weekend with first captain running in the grade two Fayette at Keeneland and Jackson Traveler in the grade three Bold Rover Ruler at Belmont. We'll be right back from this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse. Every step of the way, when it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up and down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. The TD and Riders Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think 50 years of combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, then give Tommy or Wendy a call because they personally advise you on each horse as if that horse were their own. Legacy Bloodstock, by the way, has almost 100 offerings catalog for the upcoming Keeneland November breeding stock sale. Their first two horses to go through the ring in book one will be an American Pharaoh Colt and then a Philly by Authentic, who happens to be a half-sister to grade one winner, Lady Ivanka. And the Remy cartoon is in this week. And with all these horses coming to the Breeders' Cup from foreign lands and this or that, Remy wondered, do horses have uh, jet lag? And he's got a horse obviously coming in from Europe saying, oi, lads, is it just me who can't sleep? Another good one from our friend Remy Block. That's another wrap on this week's edition of the TDN Riders Room presented by Keelan. I want to thank my co-hosts, Zoe Cabman, Randy Moss. I want to thank our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, our producer, Patty Wolf, our editors, Nathan Wilkinson, Ali LaRocca, and Anthony LaRocca, and our mascot, Lucy. We'll talk to you next week. Lucy, you got a call.